what's the target that keeps us moving forward? Because if you don't have a vision, if you don't have a target, if you don't have an aim or a telos in life, an aim in life, the gravitational pull towards your comfort zone is always stronger. You have to put something out ahead of you that acts as a stronger force than the force of gravity towards your comfort and familiarity. Now, if you're in outright crisis mode, great. Like, you don't have a comfort zone, so you're having to do a lot of stuff that's moving you forward. But as, as may have been pushed or challenged, you might be to a certain place of financial security. You're not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination, but you're not suffering. And at that point, there's a temptation that pulls you towards the gravitational pull of just getting by. Maybe a little, a little more. Maybe throwing in some giving every once in a while, but, but I'm good. The gravitational pull is towards, towards your comfort. So you have to have an aim. You have to have a goal. You have to have a vision that is outside of you, that is further away, that you're moving toward. So in change, in packing up and moving, in, in leaving this mountain, what's our tether that keeps us grounded and what's our target that keeps us moving forward? And I want to make this as simple as possible. That's something coming into Jubilee and coming out of Jubilee that I feel strong as a word of the Lord is simplicity. Stop making things complicated. The, there's, there's a natural law of entropy where there's a natural outward motion towards chaos and complexity and complications. And we don't make it better usually. I don't make it better. Um, and, and you can't just ignore complexity for the sake of simplicity. Otherwise, it's not simple. It's just dumb. Because you can't, you can't just wipe complexity away. Life is complex. We're human beings. We're complex creatures. If you're in a relationship of any kind, whether it's marriage or raising children or just friendships, you're, with a, you're in a relationship with another complicated human being. That's not even gender specific. Dudes, you're not simple. You're just pretentious. You pretend your way into being simple. <laughs> you might be less complex, but that doesn't make you not complex. We're human beings. We're, we're complex. And, and when you take into account the flesh, the devil, and the world, things get complicated. There's challenges. And so, so I do believe, though, that as, as we try to understand complexity, it's, it's not hard to get overwhelmed and just kind of write it all off. But, but there is a simplicity to Christ. And so th this is where in, in packing up, moving on, in leaving this mountain, in moving into the fullness of what God has for us as a church, it's important to me that we keep grounded in some simplicity that acts as both our tether to keep us grounded, but also our target that moves us forward. And it's just simply this, following Jesus. It's all about Jesus. That's as simple as we can get. And because I love Dallas Willard and we're going to talk about discipleship, it's always good to quote him. Uh, and I love, I love how he puts things into words, especially when it comes to the need for discipleship. And he says this uh, in his book, The Great Omission. The greatest issue facing the world today, that's a big statement, it's a big frame, with, with the greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs is whether those who are, ident who are identified as Christians will become disciples, students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus Christ. Steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of the heavens into every corner of human existence. And I don't think he's speaking in hyperbole or exaggeration. Because I believe Jesus truly is the answer for a world gone wrong. It's not, it's not a pretentious statement. It's not just because I haven't thought it through or you haven't thought it through. There is great wisdom there are great philosophical ideas and thoughts that stretch us about Jesus, but it's just simply Jesus truly is the answer to a world gone wrong. He's the answer to your life gone wrong. You're, he's the answer to your life going right. He just is the answer. He's the answer. And so 
It's important that, though, we keep Jesus and his words in context because in 2,000 years of Christian history after Jesus, things might have gotten off track a time or two. Can I oversimplify the last 2,000 years of history into that way? It's gotten off track a time or two. And, it's, and, and in a, a culture that has been in times past highly Christianized, it's not hard for other things to be added on to Jesus or Jesus' mes- message and mission to be tempered, to be um, for a veneer or a varnish to get over, to just kind of soften Jesus' rough edges, to make him a little more culturally appropriate. Well, in a post-Christian society, which we have become, the West as a whole definitely in America, in, in, in the, the large uh, social structures of our country, and in, in most pockets of culture, we are a post-Christian society, okay? So it's never been more important to understand the message and mission of Jesus, and to, to try to fight through the varnish culture has put over him. The way his words have been just slightly edited or polished a bit. But Jesus makes certain definitive claims and you're not going to be able to get around them. And discipleship to Jesus, I agree with what Dallas Willard says, that it's the greatest need today. Those who have adopted the identity of Christian which a whole lot of people have. It's less and less, but it's still the vast majority. It's in the 70-something percent of our country still claim to be Christian and having some type of faith in Jesus, whether they know it or not or just cultural or whatever. Christian, identifies Christian. And he's saying, as much as we need to make more Christians, what the greatest emphasis needs to be is those who have said yes to Jesus actually do what he says. That our faith in Jesus be more than just what we call mental ascent. You ascend mentally to some thoughts about Jesus. That it act, we actually become disciples. And the, there's three statements that I want to look at. That th- I should say maybe say three invitations Jesus makes uh, in, in different gospels, in different times of his ministry. There's a, a lot more that Jesus says. I mean, there's four gospel accounts, so there's more. But in wanting to keep this simple, I want to look, just look at three invitations he makes, and I'm only going to get to two of them. Uh, the third one will have to be its own series another time. But Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, makes the invitation, follow me. Towards the middle of his ministry, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 11, he says, come to me. And then at the end of his ministry, in a private conversation with his disciples before his passion and suffering and crucifixion, he says, abide in me. That's the one we're just going to have to kick that can. Uh, There's a whole lot to that. Um, So I want to examine the first two. Follow me and come to me. This week, just going to focus on follow me. Follow me. Anytime Jesus encountered a new crowd, he was adamant about, inviting them to discipleship. Even in his preaching, he didn't, what a phrase you will not find in the Gospels, Jesus saying out of his mouth is, accept me. Did you know that? And see, that's what we've made the vast majority of our gospeling, our witnessing, our evangelism, is that do you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? And I'm not saying that that's theologically wrong, it just didn't come from Jesus' mouth. And so as much as I would like to take the things that we, that we have done and, and see where their, their veracity is in Scripture, I also want to take seriously the words that are in red. The ones that came from Jesus' mouth. And what he was emphatic about was, follow me. Follow me. And then when someone, you can look in a couple other places in Matthew chapter 9 uh, and in Mark chapter 2. Um, it's definitely Matthew, uh, where someone kind of popped out of the, because Jesus had a big crowd, but not all of them were his disciples. Some guy would pop out of the crowd and be like, hey, I'll follow you anywhere you go. And Jesus is like, there ain't no guarantees in life, dude. If 
Foxes have holes, birds have nests, son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And then he looks at another guy and says, follow me. And he's like, yeah, I'm on that, except can I go back and get my inheritance from my father? And he's like, let the dead bury the dead. <laughs> the, words of red, the words in red are pretty intense sometimes. And it's all about counting the cost. In Luke, he says that if you want to follow me unless you hate your father, mother, and then he lists all those relational things. And he says, even your own life, then you're not worthy of my discipleship. That's how serious this is. And that's why many people don't mind calling themselves Christians. But when it comes to actually being Jesus' disciples, we think that it's a buffet that we don't have to choose everything on the menu. Let's just take the things that taste good to me. I like this whole forgiveness of sin stuff. That's great. I like that. Sweet. Sweet to the taste. It's inviting. The goodness of God does lead men to repentance. But this whole thing about living a life of repentance, that I could be wrong, that I have to love certain things less than Jesus, and I don't get to choose what I'm supposed to love more or less. Oh, yeah, that stuff. I'll, I'll leave that stuff. That's for, that's for the serious people. That's not the way this is going to go. And so Jesus' invitation to follow me in Mark chapter 1, verse 17, he announces the kingdom of God is breaking forth into reality in Mark 1, 15. Two verses later, he goes to some blue-collar workers, some fishermen, who are making a living, not poor, but not wealthy, just barely scraping by. And he says, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. A few stories later in Mark chapter 2, he looks at, the, he looks at a, different, a different person, a white-collar, corrupt politician, and says, follow me, Levi, or Matthew. So Jesus is not discriminate to blue-collar or white-collar workers. He opens the invitation to all sorts of people. It's who responds to him is what makes the difference. And Matthew, the tax collector, there's potentially a whole lot more of those coming around. <laughs> Jesus just simply opens the invitation. Follow me. And he keeps walking. He keeps moving. Jesus is moving somewhere. And he says, follow me. And Matthew, the tax collector, gave it all up in an instant. But the same thing with these fishermen. Gave it up in a moment. They saw something in Jesus worth following and worth answering that invitation. Follow me and I will make you become. And a whole other series another time is really what the journey Jesus is taking us on is not a journey towards a destination. It's a journey towards transformation. That's what he's after. He's after your transformation he accepts us and loves us where we are, but loves us too much to leave us where we are. He wants to mature us, to grow us, and he does it by being with us and us being with him.